Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Johnson and then um, give us a couple of minutes to, while I do, will not take me a couple of minutes, but, uh, you know, get people to join. Um, I don't remember, Sean, when you graduated from Bel Air. I know you've told me a million times, but I don't remember. Uh, 2006. Oh, my gosh. Pretty uh, sure. <laughs> You were an IB diploma candidate recipient, not the candidate, but a recipient. Um, right? Am I remembering that right? <laughs> uh, yes, okay. I was. I think probably by like this much. But Well, I mean, <laughs> that does not matter. I see some of the IB candidates are on here and they hear me say all the time that done is better than good. So we're going to go with that. Um, uh Actually, Sean, I'm going to need you to talk about your graduate career, but I know you went to University of Chicago, right? Uh, yep, for and, undergrad and for grad school. Oh, so it was both. I was about to say yep. that. And I thought I was just getting it wrong. Um, and I know you've done some postdoc work I'm going to let you talk about, and you are about to embark on a brand new uh, professional slash, edu slash educational um, career. And by the way, those of you viewing in the audience, there are some dogs in the camera view so we're all lucky there <laughs> i will be oh that's so cute i'll be uh looking at the the chats and if people raise their hand uh um otherwise what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna turn it over to dr johnson i'm gonna mute myself and let him go you can share the screen i'll take care of the details cool all right sounds right, good before. um before I start, should we just give everyone a chance to introduce themselves and say a little bit about what their interests are? Or is that going to take too much your time? your call. If you want to do that, go for it. If you can get them yeah. to talk, I'll be amazed. Okay. Let's at least try. Maybe just in the order that people are listed on in the meeting. Does anybody want to unmute and say what they're trying to do? I can, I can unmute. unmute. Hello. Um, I'm Jasmine. I'm a senior. I'm going to Rice next year to study to study astrophysics. So awesome. very excited to hear what you have to say about that. All right. Hi, Go Deborah. For it. I'm going to Wellesley next year um, to study, hopefully, uh, physics. But I've always been interested in astrophysics. I just want to take more classes relating to it before I decide my major. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, I'm Vishwam, and I'm going to Texas A&M for physics. All the physics people mute. <laughs> Anybody else? Hello. I'm Stephen Huttenbuck. I'm also going to A&M. I'm going to be a mechanical engineer. But uh, I really like the astronomy and stuff like that ever since I took Mr. Newland's class, and it was very fascinating. Cool. There are actually a lot of mechanical engineers that work on telescopes, so. Neat. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Nicholas. I joined two seconds ago because <laughs> I was in the middle of a talk with the A&M Corps of Cadets recruiter. Um, I'm hoping to go there in a year. I'm a rising senior right now. And yeah, I'm interested in physics and engineering. Uh, my name is Malachi. I'm sure you've heard of me. I like doing this stuff for fun. He's a rising senior. We, we hope. Anyone else? Hello, this is Annie. I'm also a rising senior and I really enjoy physics and science in general. Uh, my name is Donovan, um, and next year I'm going to be going to UT Austin for civil engineering. Awesome. Anybody else want to weigh in? Can you all hear me yet? Yeah. Yes, Owen. Okay, cool. Um, I'm Owen. I'm going to Colorado College for, I don't know, environmental science maybe. I'm Winston, I'm a rising senior, and I'm planning to discover aliens. <laughs> All right. Any
anyone else, or should I get going? All right, so I'm uh, Sean Johnson. As Mr. Newland uh, said, I graduated from Bel Air a while ago now, and then went to grad school at University of Chicago, and I'm now a Princeton, a postdoc at Princeton. Uh, so I work on observations of galaxy evolution. Um, and starting in the fall, I'll be a professor at the University of Michigan. Um, so now I'm trying to navigate moving in a pandemic, which has been fun. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about today is mostly what astronomy, did this screen share work? Yes? Yep. Y'all see, okay. What astronomy as a career trajectory looks like, um, sort of what the pros and cons are and things like that. Um, and then mostly just take whatever questions y'all have. Um, so I guess the most important Point from the start is that astronomy as a profession looks nothing like what people often imagine. Um, so the sort of classic view that people often who like, you know, if I'm giving a talk at a bar or something like that, people come up and ask how often I look through a telescope. So here you can see <clears throat> someone looking through the eyepiece on Carolyn and William Herschel's great telescope back in the 1790s. Um, and that's something that you almost never do unless you're doing a star party uh, as a professional astronomer. You always control a telescope using a computer uh, and analyze the data with usually custom code that you've written. So this is what working astronomers look like over on the right, um, which is actually a lot of fun, even though it's just sitting in front of a computer. Um, so I work on observations of galaxy evolution. Uh, so that's a combination of working with really, really big uh, astronomical surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, pointed observations, and now you're seeing my cat. Sorry about that. Um, observations with large telescopes like the Magellan 6.5 meter telescopes in Chile, uh, as well as a lot of data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and then now I'm working on planning for future telescopes like James Webb, which will hopefully launch very soon, uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope, and the extremely large telescope, which are being built now and will hopefully be ready to use in five to 10 years. Um, and just in terms of like what that looks like day to day, uh, something like 40% of your typical astronomer is going to be, of their time is going to be spent on uh, research, which involves things like planning and executing observations. Um, and even though that's a large fraction of your time over the course of a year, you actually don't spend a huge amount of time at telescopes, typically something like 10 nights per year, um, if you have a lot of telescope access. And then the rest of your time is spent analyzing that data, which involves a lot of coding, um, modeling to interpret the data, which also involves coding, uh, and writing uh, up the results in papers and presentations. Um, and then if you're teaching, you spend another 40% of your time roughly on that, plus another 20% or so on things like mentoring students, reviewing proposals and things like that. Um, so the sort of summary in terms of major perks as a career track is that you get paid to study really cool stuff, uh, work with smart people and travel to a lot of different places under normal circumstances anyway. Um, and the employment prospects are really, really good. So the unemployment rate for astronomy PhDs and physics PhDs is almost zero. Um, although if you want to continue working professionally in astronomy, uh, the fraction of PhDs who end up doing that is quite a bit smaller, more like 50%. Um, another extreme really nice perk is that the hours are incredibly flexible. Um, I guess drawbacks are it's competitive if you want to keep doing astronomy long term. Um, you're not going to get rich, although the salaries are good. Um, and you don't often look through telescopes, which is something that I definitely wish I could do more. Um, yeah. So let's see. The different sort of career options. Oh, one thing I should say is that this 
everything I put together is astronomy specific sort of, but it looks almost the same for any other science. So if you're interested in chemistry, biology, and things like that, the uh, career trajectories and things like that actually look very, very similar. All right, so among what people often call professional astronomers, uh, those are people who get paid day to day to do something related to astronomy. There are about 7,000 of us around the country about half are on a sort of academic track, which means you're working at a university as a professor, or a permanent research staff, uh, as a postdoc or as a grad student. And the other half of those 7,000, uh, or almost half of those 7,000 are in a non-academic track, which still involves lots of research, teaching and outreach, but outside of a university. So sometimes that means working at an observatory to build or maintain uh, telescopes, working at planetariums and museums to put up exhibits and educate the public, uh, working at national laboratories or independent research institutions that sort of do all the research parts that, uh, that universities do, but none of the teaching. Um, and then there's actually a decent fraction, about 10% of professional astronomers work in the private sector uh, at tech companies. So there's for example, a few people who work on galaxy simulations uh, who work at IBM and they spend something like half their time writing algorithms and de designing chips for IBM. And then with the other half of their time, they get to do whatever astronomy research they want to. That's less common than it used to be, but it still exists. Um, there's a lot of people who work at NASA or as military contractors to work on either space telescopes or spy satellites. Uh, there's people who work on curriculum development uh, in science policy consulting and many more things. So these are sort of a subset of the private sector that still touches astronomy pretty closely. Um, so the other half of people who earn astronomy PhDs end up working in other fields, uh, mostly in the private sector. Uh, and not doing astronomy. And the reason for that is that if you take this, basically the size of astronomy PhD programs uh, and the number of times it takes, uh, years it takes to complete a degree, you just produce more PhDs than there are professor jobs available. Um, and that turns out to be a good thing because a lot of people finish a PhD and decide that they want to go and do something else, not necessarily uh, because they regret getting a PhD in astronomy, but because they just have decided that it's not for them. Um, so about half of the people I went to grad school are doing other things with are doing other things now, uh, but none of them regret getting a PhD because it involves a lot of really useful skill development <clears throat> uh, that helps getting uh, jobs at places like tech companies and software development, optical engineering, aeronautics, uh, consulting firms, journalism, and even intellectual property law, things like that. Um, any questions about that so far? Uh, Sean, there was one question that someone asked uh, that isn't specifically about this career uh, slide, uh, mm -hmm. but Malachi asked, uh, why would one travel to places, uh, you know, like a remote observing site if you're interacting with the computer? I don't know if you want to save that till later, if you want to tackle it now. No, that's a great question. So um, I can, I guess, go back to this slide. So these two telescopes are the ones I use a lot. Uh, they're in Chile. Um, and they are operated in what's called classic mode. So you actually almost always travel there and observe on site. Um, many telescopes are now operated either in queue mode, which means you tell the observatory what you would like to do. Uh, and then uh, they just kind of do it when the weather is good enough or operated remotely, which means you just control the computer over the internet. Um, but the data rate is often too high for that. Uh, and in Chile, in particular, the uh, observatories are all relatively close to a main road that's also used by mining companies. And they do construction and mining and things like that. And 
fairly frequently cut the cable to the internet connection. Um, so that's actually the main reason that we don't operate Magellan remotely. Um, it seems kind of silly, but that's why, for now at least. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that's actually very good stuff. I'm making notes myself. Thank you. Um, sure. The other reason is often you will things will work more efficiently if the astronomers and the observatory staff are working together closely, uh, and you lose a little bit of that when you run a telescope remotely. Um, obviously, you gain in not having to spend time on an airplane, but there's benefits to in-person observing. Okay, so this is just uh, a brief uh, overview of what it takes to sort of get on a career path in astronomy. Um, so this is a definitely a PhD driven field. So there are people who work in astronomy who don't have PhDs, but the majority do. Um, and the sort of path to get that involves not surprisingly you know, four years of undergrad, uh, another five to six years of grad school. And that time you get both a master's and a doctoral degree uh, sort of all in one shot. So you don't have to reapply between them and things like that. Um, so one of the nice things about astronomy and all, most of the other sciences in the US is PhD programs are fully funded. So they'll cover, the university will cover your tuition and also a salary while you're a student. Um, so you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, after that, there's a postdoc, which is a lot like a residency for doctors. Um, so that's roughly, you typically do one to two of these, and they're typically three-year research positions where you do research full-time. And then after that, the hope is if you want to keep doing astronomy, that you have a permanent position at a university or a national lab uh, and things like that. So just digging into the details a bit more, um, and this is the sort of most immediate path for y'all, uh, and that is going to undergrad and majoring in something related to astronomy. Um, so a lot of people who end up with PhDs in astronomy majored in physics, astronomy, math, engineering, just anything that's you know physics heavy or math heavy. Uh, is pretty good. Um, and the skills that you need to pick up beyond that, like what's directly involved in your major, are mostly coding, uh, statistics, uh, technical and science writing, and that's one that gets neglected, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then also developing sort of critical thinking and writing skills more generally in non-science fields, and that's just useful for learning how to communicate well uh, in writing. Um, then during the course of your undergrad, uh, doing a pretty significant amount of summer of research, either during the summer or during the school year. <clears throat> and a lot of universities are now paying uh, students over the summers so that they don't have to worry about getting summer jobs and things like that. So you can get that research experience while getting uh, paid, which is quite nice. Um, get involved in at least one research project heavily enough that you're sort of on a path towards publishing a paper in a journal. Uh, and that's important, not just for sort of adding to your CV, uh, but also to make sure that you actually enjoy the process. Um, and then at the end of it all, if you still want to go to grad school in the sciences, applying to grad school. So the things that are important to keep in mind are very similar to what you uh, have to do for applying to uh, undergrad. So they'll when evaluating your application, they'll look at grades, letters of recommendation, uh, personal statements, but also publications, which is a bit different. Um, and one of the things that is important to sort of keep in mind is that you don't need, when you're applying to grad school, uh, you don't need to know exactly what you'd like to work on. So if you just apply to an astronomy or physics program, you can just sort of express general interest in doing physics and you you won't be like pigeonholed into working on one particular thing. Um, the reason that PhDs take six, five to six years to finish is because there's some time built in there for sort of choosing your specialty, if that makes sense. Any questions on the undergrad 
part? Uh, actually, um, I have a couple of questions in the chat, but I kind of feel like maybe we should wait until we get to the end. So don't let me forget, Winston and Vishwam, to uh, let you guys ask your questions when we get towards the end. All right. Sounds good. Um, so after finishing undergrad and getting into uh, grad school, uh, you'll start working at a typically research university because they have to be PhD granting. Um, and almost all of the ones in the U.S. have a combined master's and PhD program. So you'll, what that means is you just apply once as an undergrad, you get in, and then as long as you make progress uh, on your courses, past classes, and things like that, you get your master's sort of two years in, and then continue on to get to your doctoral degree. Um, you should not go to a PhD program in astronomy, at least, and physics as well that doesn't give you full financial support um, because that's just what all of the schools are doing and if they're not doing it you should go to a different school um, so the what that means is that your full tuition is covered by the university uh, and you get a grad student stipend which is just your paycheck um, it's not you know you're not going to get rich doing it but it's more than enough to live on and you can be pretty comfortable as well um, and that funding comes from a combination of your work as a teaching assistant and also from research grants. So in your faculty advisor will have uh, grants that pay you to work on a certain project. Um, so the full course of getting a PhD typically takes five to six years. Uh, one to two years of that is sort of advanced coursework in physics and astronomy with part-time research, maybe a third of your time at most. Um, in that time, you're sort of expected to decide on a specialty and often a specific advisor who's usually a professor. Um, and then after that, you spend three to four years really doing research full-time, uh, writing papers, working on your PhD thesis, um, going to conferences and presenting going on observing runs if you're an observer, things like that. Um, and then at the end of it all, uh, you apply to postdoc jobs uh, and hopefully successfully defend your PhD thesis, um, which fortunately, the fail rate on that is very, very low because by the time you've gotten to that point, they already know you're going to pass. Um, then there's postdocs, which are really a lot like medical residency programs. So you do research full time for three years and typically doing one to two postdocs. Um, you're not taking any classes. You do have an advisor and mentors, but you're doing mostly independent work. Um, and then during that time, if you want to continue uh, on the sort of academic track, you start applying to more permanent positions. Um, so yeah, it's uh, that's pretty much it. Um, it's a lot of fun and very interesting work. Um, up until COVID, uh, the, one of the big perks, at least in my mind, was getting to travel a lot. Um, so you get to see places like New Mexico, Arizona, Hawaii, Chile. Some observers even get to go to Antarctica, which is really cool. Um, and conferences are held just about everywhere. Um, and they're always fun. Um, the one cautionary note I would always give is if you want to get rich, doing astronomy is not the right career path. Um, you'll always, the salaries are good, but they're not, you know, you're not going to be Elon Musk uh, making a billion dollars. And on that note, um, just a reminder to watch the launch today. So there were questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so there were a few in here. Um, oh, well, let me turn my camera back on. I know how annoying it is to talk to circles with letters in it, so <laughs> I'm turning my camera on. No, let's see. Uh, Winston asked this question, and Winston, I want you to unmute if I get this wrong. He said, which career paths would not need much coding knowledge? Uh, and as a former computer science teacher, uh, and a uh, physics teacher, I would say none of them, but I'm going to let Sean tackle it. <laughs> yeah, so there are, I don't think there are any research jobs in astronomy that don't involve coding. Um, there are, at least in grad school. 
after grad school, there are certainly jobs that would keep you doing astronomy that don't involve too much coding. Um, so the one that comes to mind is science journalism. Um, doesn't have to involve a lot of coding. It's also a relatively small subset of astronomers, just because there isn't a huge amount of demand, although it's there. Um, there are also observatory support jobs and things like that, where you will control things through computers, but someone else will do the actual coding. Um, so you have a GUI and things like that. Um, but the other thing I would add is that coding is, I know because Mr. Newland taught me, uh, something that you can just learn if you put your mind to it. Um, and the actual formal requirements for coding is, is there isn't much. Um, so the only coding class I took was at Bel Air High, actually. Um, and everything else <laughs> you just pick up uh, sort of on the job. That was a long time ago. Yep, lots of Java. <laughs> You're still doing Java. Okay, so, uh, and I'm not quite sure what Winston was asking because I feel like he would be a very competent coder. And then Vishwam, who mentioned he wanted to do uh, a physics major, uh, he was asking about essentially the everything I feel like Dr. Johnson shared about uh, the undergrad, graduate, postdoc experience is very similar for physics. Is that yeah. fair, do you it, think? Yeah, it is almost exactly the same. Um, physics, the main diff. so a lot of astronomy PhDs actually get their degree in a physics department. A lot of programs are joint and have just physics and astronomy all in one department. Um, and so in, in those places, there's no difference at all. The only major difference, I think, now is that physics programs have more courses in the first two years than an astronomy only program. Um, but that's like, that feels like a major difference when you're in the courses, but it really isn't. <laughs> okay, hang on just a second here. I'm cleaning up the windows. Uh, one thing about Teams is it's very resource intensive, um, even though I know they're working on it. Let's see. Um, let me go back here. We have one from another one from Vishwam who asked about uh, grants and international students. What do you yeah. what, what, what do you have to say about that? Um, so grants is a huge topic. Well, we at the point at that point you were talking about how grants often pay for ah, okay. RAs, yeah. TAs, and things like that. Yep. Yep. So international students can be funded by grants and TAs in almost the same way as domestic students. So you get a, as a student at the university, they will get you a student visa that allows you to be paid through the grants. Um, the only exception is that there are a few sort of prestigious fellowships from the National Science Foundation that do require citizenship. I didn't know but that. That is a tiny fraction of the funding. Um, and there are actually similar fellowships for non-US citizens. So the Fulbright program, for example, funds people from all over to come to the US and study. Um, I know my experience as a physics major and in academia so far is that very many American universities, I mean, the number of people who are from other countries on a, you know, working as students is like a huge volume of people. So it yep. even may give, uh, you know, you may have the wrong kind of view of, of what universities are like if all you see are, you may think that everybody's from a foreign country, but um, that's not necessarily always the case. It's also not the same in uh, uh, education as it was in physics. <laughs> um, I mean, I was... In my class, there were, in my year, I mean, in grad school, there were six students in the Astro. I was the only person from the U.S. in that year. Um, the following year, it was the other way around. There were five people from the U.S. and one international. So it, it's small number statistics, but it's yeah. probably 50-50 overall. Uh, and then Annie Zhu had a question. When you code programs to analyze data, do you use your own personal computer or are you usually provided with equipment uh, that, or do you have to buy it yourself? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So for undergrads, it's a little bit mixed. Um, for grad school, they will almost certainly buy you a laptop. 
um, and you can work on that or a desktop if you prefer for some reason. Uh, and then most departments and universities also have computing clusters and you can use those if you have uh, if you're running programs that require more than you know whatever's on a typical desktop or laptop. So I personally run almost everything on a desktop that Princeton gave me um, and occasionally use a supercomputer, but not very often. That's a flex. <laughs> um, and then I have a comment from uh, Owen that just says GUI with a broken heart emoji. I don't know what that's about, but uh, <laughs> Chris Woodard, let's see. Did you face a lot of competition when looking for undergraduate research opportunities? And then he put as a comment, may vary on school. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So this does vary significantly from school to school and also from department to department. So if you're at a school that has a higher faculty to student ratio, um, there will be a little bit less competition. But overall, within physics and astronomy, the competition for undergrad research experience is not huge. Um, the competition to get into grad school is, but if what you want to do is just like find someone to work with, there's normally plenty of opportunities. Um, so the program at UT, for example, um, they have something like a hundred astronomy majors a year, um, and they all do research with either a postdoc or a professor. It's required for the degree. That does change if you're in chemistry and biology, then the competition gets pretty stiff. So also I would add that uh, computer science, like in say 2006, for example, computer science at University of Texas was a fairly small major. In 2020, it's a very large major, but Bel Air students for, you know, from the time Sean was there until now, go to UT for comp science, still do research, even though that's a little bit different sort of field. I just wanted to, that's my own take on it. Um, let's see, wait. There was Chris's question, Winston, uh, always complaining about coding issues. Um, they can be rough. Okay, what you gonna do? Um, and then there, yeah, here's the question. Debugging is always a pain, that never changes. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> um, and Just for everybody's like edification, Sean was in my computer science class, which ch changed tremendously from the time that you were a student until, you know, I quit doing that program. But my experience working with astronomers as a this, you know, as a teacher and a, you know, academic myself is that their computing skills are all over the place. Some people are like really competent and other people are hunting and pecking and copying from uh, you know, forums on the internet, and if it works, it works. It's I think yeah. that's great, but it's like all over the place, and that's actually what I'm. You know, my own personal research is in that very area, like how they, well, like how they intersect. Um, now, Winston had a question: How easy is it to segue from an astronomy major slash PhD to an aerospace career? That's a good question. Um, it is relatively easy, but not painless. So it depends on what you want to do in an aerospace program. So if you want to go from like a optical observational astronomer to designing rockets or something like that, you'll probably have to get uh, either a lot of on the job training uh, or uh, spend some time in a master's program. Uh, I know people who've done that. So I know someone who earned a physics PhD then decided that she wanted to work uh, for Lockheed Martin, and they actually paid for her to go and get a master's program in engineering. So the good thing is that once you get through the astronomy grad program, people are like, okay, you're a competent human, and we can invest some resources in you so that you can design stuff for us later on. Um, and that still happens pretty frequently. Uh, there are also specialized programs that allow you to do both. Um, so, for example, the University of Arizona has a joint degree in optical engineering and astronomy. Um, and from that, you can go and do, you know, any sort of optical engineering you want, whether it's in astronomy or uh, doing something else. Um, and University of Michigan and Texas A&M, I think, have joint programs in space science, which means you do 
some astronomy research, but your main focus uh, is, or half of your focus is actually building instruments to go in space. That's right. um, yep. I would also add that uh, University of Texas and Texas A&M and um, University of Houston, I'm just thinking of ones off the top of my head, I know we're doing this, have undergraduate rocket design programs. So for those of you who are, you know, going to be entering your um, undergraduate careers, there are rocket programs for people who know nothing to get you in the ground of designing rockets and payloads and software. Um, let's see. And then Winston had another comment, but is it, was it a question? I wonder if we could, he's asking, he's thinking out loud here or thinking in, in the chat box, uh, if you could outsource it. And the answer to that is, I don't know. Jasmine though asked, can you please talk about your research a little bit? I know Jasmine's another one of the people considering uh, physics as a research career. Sure, um, so I work on observations of the gas around galaxies for the most part. Um, so if you look at the sort of full extent of a galaxy and its total mass, that's actually a tiny fraction of the normal matter that you expect to be there in a galaxy. So if you, the only things you know about are cosmology, uh, gravity, and how gases cool, then you'll, and you sort of throw those into a computer and run a simulation, um, the prediction is that something like 90% of the normal matter in the universe should be in stars. Um, it turns out that that is very far from being true. So less than 10% of the normal matter in the universe is actually in stars. Um, and the reason for this, we think, is that some gas pools forms a galaxy, uh, stars form, and then supernovae explode, and that drives the gas back out and produces these sort of cycles of uh, gas flows that regulate galaxy evolution. And what I work on is combining observations of galaxies and that gas to try and piece together how galaxies evolve over time. I don't know if that Kevin's was... still here. Kevin, are you still in this call? But Kevin actually worked on uh, a project that Sean helped oversee and was their, their research, men research mentor. Um, Oh, and Sean, I, just, I should have shared this with you earlier. I can't believe I forgot. Last year, there was a student named Abby Chopra, who was one of the student members, and she messaged me. She's at University of Houston, not in a STEM career, but she ended up getting a research internship based on her, like, sharing of the involvement in that project. I didn't give oh, her cool. I don't know if they reached out to you, but they didn't reach out to me, and they specifically told her that her, you know, willingness to get involved in that kind of research showed that she was the kind of person they wanted. So for awesome. those of you out there uh, who are looking for projects that may be like a little bit off what you're normally doing, showing that you're interested in a project like that obviously makes a huge difference. That's great. So Jasmine, I can personally share with you a little bit more about that if you're interested. And then Winston said, I don't know, you, Sean, I'm going to let you answer this how you want. He said, for research about astrophysics, would it be mainly in-body problem stuff? In-body problem stuff. You mean like in-body in codes? Like the in-body. So, yeah, okay. So solving the orbits of multiple uh, bodies. So it depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're doing cosmology that involves dark matter only simulations, yeah, those are in-body codes. Um, but as soon as you want to know about how galaxies form and evolve, evolve you have to add uh, fluid dynamics. And that is a whole big mess that complicates it significantly. Um, so if you major in physics, you'll hear about the Navier-Stokes equations, and they are hard to solve. <laughs> um, if you're doing exoplanets, so looking at discovering planets and figuring out their masses and orbits and things like that, um, that is mostly in body problems. And there was a lot of applied math research that went into making those codes and the differential equation solvers better, um, which is kind of cool. So like if you're doing most things with differential equations, you only have to let the system evolve for a few cycles, a few orbits or whatever the system is doing. But with exoplanets, they have to do it, you know, 
billions of times because you have a planet that's orbiting every year for billions of years. And if your solver is very slightly inaccurate, that propagates very badly. <laughs> the errors propagate badly. Um, but uh, yeah, so making better in-body codes um, and better differential equation solvers is still an active area of research, especially in uh, theoretical cosmology and in exoplanet research. I got a good one for you here from the chat box. Brian asked if you could change anything in terms of the courses you took in high school or during undergrad, what would you change? Um, in high school, I don't think I would change much. Um, I think that's true. Uh, yeah. In college, I would have tried to take a technical writing class, which I didn't do, and I regretted that. Um, I took classes that involved a lot of writing, but it's fairly different. Um, I was a pure math and physics major. Um, the pure math was fun, but it hasn't been very useful. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if I would do that again. Uh, and I definitely wish that I'd taken more formal coding classes. Not a lot, but one or two. Sure. That's that's a good answer. I really like that. Um, I'm writing down IB program served you well. That's what I'm doing over here. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That's true, for sure. Um, let's see. Winston asked, where can we learn technical writing skills in high school? That's a good question, Winston. Uh, I feel like that may be more for me than Sean. Um, I can tell you that Winston has personally reached out to me about um, research projects and he and I are going to have to talk about how we can make that sort of thing happen. But, um, I, Winston, the best I could tell you is that like the science fair writing, it's kind of sort of along the right track, probably nothing really. You guys still yeah. there? Oh, I thought, I thought it cut out on me there. I was alone. <laughs> I think that's right. Technical writing isn't taught well anywhere. And I don't, well, maybe like a, a few places, but it generally is not taught very much. And I think in high school, it's not really taught at all. I didn't. I took one course as a physics major. It was in the engineering department, Sean. And it was more like um, it was less about research writing and more about like corporate technical like, huh. you know, that's it. And it didn't really fit. Uh, it, I, I learned a lot. The professor was very hard. But um, I agree, the experience was like everything else I'd ever done in terms of writing, even since then, is very different. And I mean, I think the, what it comes down to and what I should make them do, Sean, is read some papers maybe. Because sometimes you go to read a science paper and you're like, did y'all really have to say that that way? And after you finally figure out what they were saying, you're like, oh, um, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just not that good. I don't know. <laughs> No, that's definitely true. And a lot of people think that if it sounds sophisticated, that means it's convincing. But it's yes. actually, that, that's the one thing I learned in a math major. I had a, it was very useful. I had a professor who said, uh, if, you know, when you're writing out your proof, if it's not understandable by someone who doesn't know a lot about math, then it isn't a good proof. That's good. I like that. I'm using that. His phrase was, it, a kindergartner can't read this. Go work on it more. Wow. <laughs> I don't know about that. All right. Deborah asked, uh, how did you pick and organize your classes in college, for example, according to difficulty based on what others did? Um, mostly. So always make sure you fulfill the minimum requirements for your degree. That is important. Um, and then beyond that, you know, don't. Take what you'll you think you'll enjoy and what will be useful. I don't think there's much more to it than that. Um, yeah, I usually went with more math classes and fewer physics classes because they were the teaching in the math department at Chicago, at least at that time, was much better. They cared about pedagogy and the physics department didn't. So those classes were more fun. Um, but, you know, I think. Yeah, just. Take the classes that you're enjoying and learning from. I think that's a really good requirement. I I was uh, 
you know, when I was done with my degree, I, I was in an honors program, which I know a lot of other state students going to state schools are doing. And sometimes I'm like, why am I doing this? I, I, my physics major sort of um, bias would play in. But once I graduated, some of the stuff that I really got the most out of were those ones that I got to pick that were not physics, uh, that were, you know, a little bit off the the track I was doing, and they were great. So that's yep. a good advice. Yeah, the best class I ever took was about uh, energy policy. And the entire class was basically order of magnitude estimates to figure out if one or another technology is actually scalable. That's awesome. Uh, yep, it was great. Uh, Winston asked, would reading a bunch of scientific journals help me get an idea of technical writing? Um, Sean, I'm going to let you vote uh, weigh in, but then I'll, I want to say something specific. It can. So I would say the way to do that is to, if you're working with a professor, uh, ask them to point you to a few well-written articles. And then if you can understand them, then that means they're probably well written. Um, and then you can compare the sort of what those papers did with what other papers you read do. Um, but I would say that the majority of articles are not well written. So you shouldn't take them as an example. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like, I don't know, Sean, if you look at Astrobytes ever, but I really like the way that these, you know, new, well, I guess they're not necessarily new graduate students, but graduate students take work that may be really hard to understand and then put it in terms of uh, like what an undergraduate needs. And Winston, I know we've a couple of times talked about Astrobytes, but um, once we get off the call, I'll make sure and send you some of the good ones. Cause Sean, one of the things I like is they've got the, you know, what's the term they use? The seminal papers. And they'll mm -hmm. explain them and then link to them. And it's, you know, you can go. I really think that's a good way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And I've gotten a lot of And the students who write Astrobytes are also almost always, they end up being better writers than the people who don't. I agree. That's what I, I you know, that's something I've, I've uh, over the, the few years I've been involved, just reading their stuff. Uh, not only has the quality gotten better, I noticed that the AAS, like the short, whatever AES calls their thing that's equivalent, they're just using Astrobytes now. So instead of having their own, they're just using those. Nice. Um, so anyway, Winston, I'll, I'll point you to some of the things um, that we're talking about here so you can – maybe a good way to spend you know, your summer. Brian says, do you think pineapple belongs on pizza? What do you no. think? Under no circumstances. How about a Chicago deep ditch pizza? Is that a violation of some sort of – <laughs> I I am not a big fan of deep dish, Chicago deep dish, except for in a few specific places. So there's a place called Lou Malnati's that's really good. Lou Malnati's? Lou Malnati's. You heard him say it here, no. folks. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. He said Illuminati's. It's being recorded. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, that's great. Um, I really, really appreciate your time, Sean. Um, I'm, I'm taking our movement into pizza as indication that we're done. Um, <laughs> I, I really, really appreciate you doing this. And I'm recording this. I'm going to share it with some other people. Um, I'm definitely going to share it with faculty members. So, Sean, I'm going to share it with Ms. Lindsley, for example. She's going to okay. be thrilled. Uh, Mr. That Mizzoni. was also one of the best classes I ever took. Yeah. By the way. Oh, wait. I had a question real quick. Okay, go yep. for it. Because I can't, it's not, it's not sending in a chat, but um, go for it. Basically, Chris. is it important to find like internships and research opportunities under like prestigious organizations or professors, or is it more the fact that you're doing research in the first place and not the type of research you're doing? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Could you repeat the again, question? Chris. Okay, so basically, is it important to find internships and research opportunities under prestigious like? orgs or like professors or does the type of work not matter but more the fact you're doing research or like internships in the first place yeah that's a great question i think uh doing good solid research with a mentor who can spend a lot of time working with you is more important than having a super prestigious advisor like there's value in that prestige but it's 
overestimated. Um, and so a lot of things, a lot of times you'll end up seeing, in fact, this happened in my year, people sort of flocking to the most prestigious professor, and then they get too many grad students, um, and they can't quite spend quite enough time working with them. And then when it comes to writing letters of recommendation, you can't say three times, uh, you know, that this is my best student, this is my best student, this is my best student. If you send that letter out all to the same people, they're going to be like, hey, what's going on here? Um, and that happens. So I, I'd say that getting a good research experience outweighs getting a prestigious one, for sure. That's good. Uh, Winston, wait, Winston I, want, I want Winston to unmute and ask his question, and then I think that's Deborah. And then we, I, oh, okay. I don't want to keep chunking on but go ahead, Winston. Um, I wanted to know if would it be feasible to ask professors for internships at a, as a high school senior, or would professors want undergraduates? Um, you can certainly ask. Um, you won't always get a reply, but you know there's no harm in asking. There are also programs specifically for high school students um, that are worth getting involved in as well. Um, but certainly, you know there are high school research students uh, in my department at Princeton, uh, as well as at UT Austin, Michigan, things like that. Um, in fact, I think Austin takes some of them out to McDonald every year, if I remember correctly. So there's definitely opportunities. Um, uh, Winston, Chris said in the chat that Rice has a couple of programs that uh, allow high school students to do research. And I've personally worked with some of those students. So I know that just reaching out to a professor at Rice in one of the labs can't hurt. Or UH, yep. just ask. Mr. Newland, also, do you think I'm qualified enough for that? Yes, I do, Winston. Think you're qualified. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind is don't feel like you're burdening them when you ask, because I guarantee you, if they end up mentoring you as a high school research student, the next time they write a grant to the National Science Foundation, they're going to put that in their grant as something that they did, and that's something that NSF looks kindly on. So they're, yeah. they're getting something out of it, too. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, and Deborah, I think was you, someone else tried to, I heard a female voice. Yeah. Well, that kind of answered my question. I was going to ask, like, tips on how to get involved in research opportunities and programs like that. Yeah. So if you're in college, I think just talking with the people who are teaching your classes uh, is a good way to do it. A lot of the majors will actually have a sort of formal process where you'll start taking a research class that matches you with an advisor. Um, I had one of my, my roommate in college actually sat outside a chemistry professor's door for a week. Um, <laughs> It's not usually that bad. Uh, it's normally just an email or talking to someone who's teaching your class. Um, for high school, I think talking with teachers who are involved in research at universities is the best way. And you have one uh, in front of you. Yes. <laughs> when we ask, do we need to know specifically what we want to research on or like have an idea? Or do we just say, hey, can I do research with you on this subject? <laughs> what you got I going don't, on? I don't know, actually. Mr. Newland, do you have any insight well, into that? Well, I think Deborah's asking as a college student, right? So Deborah ah. means for an undergrad, from an undergrad's perspective. Okay, yes, so sorry. I don't think you should be able to express interest in something enthusiastically, but you don't have to be yeah. an expert in it already. Um, okay. Like I got involved in summer research in astronomy because uh, I asked the professor who was teaching my E and M class who he would suggest I approach, and he suggested a person, um, and that person had a grant to pay me, uh, and I didn't want to go back to Houston for a summer job. So <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to have like a detailed application usually. So Deborah, I can tell you when I was an undergrad physics major, uh, I, you know, asked the my I had one particular professor who was doing my research class, and I said, you know, what could I do if I'm interested in astronomy? He sent me to someone, and then you know I did a, a not very good research project. 
I still did it. I published. It wasn't <laughs> great, but I did it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. I I want to keep this. You know, I want, we're we're already going longer than I wanted. What other questions you guys have? But be mindful that Dr. Johnson is getting ready to move. SpaceX in 30 minutes, says Winston. So um, Winston actually shared way up in this particular team. Uh, well, I guess it's not on this call, but in the in the team, a link um, that, you know, I think it was just a link to the SpaceX website, right, Winston? I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I know that there are, you know, uh, Sean, there was another student of mine who went to Bel Air a little bit after you named Jess Hester. Uh, okay. or Carolyn Hester might be someone you went to school with. I don't remember. But anyway, Jess used to work for uh, SpaceX. And on days they would do launches, she would text me and give me this sort of back channeled, super stressful sort of, you know, yep. live feed of she was on the, the coding testing team. And um, it was a terrible experience for her. Um, no, 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 I don't think that's true. I think a lot of what she got from SpaceX was great, but you know, they were, they, at this time they were still in the startup mentality and it can be hard for someone who wants to have a career and a family and, you know, they wanted her to work all the time. And, um, but anyway, the, whenever there was a SpaceX launch, I would always have this sort of two, there's the public view and she would give me these Text uh, that I probably wasn't supposed to know. I'm sure <laughs> Elon Musk would want to take my phone, but um, it was a very strange experience. So I have a very love hate relationship with SpaceX. I feel like they really are serving our uh, you know crude spaceflight program in a way that no one else is doing. But also Elon Musk is crazy, so uh, you know it's two sides. Yeah, I've I've heard more or less the same thing. It's from people who ended up working there it is not a company that you want to work for long term yeah and she did have some great experiences but like for example she had to put jess on all her emails because she didn't want anybody to know she was a woman in many yep. of their video uh sessions she would not have the camera on and would try not to talk and stuff like that but that was a long time ago i'm sure it's changed fully and it's a wonderful place to work now since i am going to share this with other people <laughs> Uh, okay, um, I'm going to handle any more questions because I feel bad. I didn't mean to keep you so long. Uh, You're sorry. so like helpful and conscientious with your time. And, um, you know, it goes to show that cardinal pride never really goes. <laughs> so uh, we all wanted to say thank you for doing this. It's really great. Um, I'm definitely planning to keep up with you as you start your uh, professorship and uh, you and your significant other move. In the middle of this pandemic, I'm sorry. Um, I hope your dog's jaw gets better. Oh, yeah, it'll be fine. He hasn't even noticed, except that he can't eat normally. So, <laughs> Okay. Well, um, I'm going to let you have the rest of the afternoon, and I'm going to hang out here, guys, and answer any more questions. But uh, we all owe Sean a big thank you. So, I don't know, use the applause icon or something. Thank Unmute you, Dr. Sean Johnson. Thanks, yeah, my pleasure. Doc. Thank, thank you. you. Doc. Thank, you. Thank you. Old Doc Johnson. That's him. All right. Bye, Sean. Thank you Bye. so much. My pleasure.